Hello everyone um, and welcome to Stories from the Continent, the home of African success stories. My name is Hadi, um, Salam alaikum everybody. Um, first off, I'd just like to say thank you to everyone for all the positive feedback and the love and support that we received um, from our first episode uh, last week. Um, I'm so grateful that our vision has been kind of well received by everyone. Uh, like I said last week, for me, the seed was planted really when I was working on a project and I was looking for black and ethnic minority leaders to speak to. And, you know, as we all do, we turn to Google and I really just couldn't find anybody apart from our historical figures that you hear of and see only during Black History Month. Um, so, you know, it, it was a bit, I, I just thought, well, that's weird. You know, where are the stories? Uh, why are they hard to find? And also why are they more importantly not being narrated by, you know, people like myself? Um, so I'm really hoping that this show will be able to kind of address and redress um, some of these issues. Um, so we'll get into today's episode at a time when we're seeing an outcry for justice and change, um, especially um, from people um, in ethnic minority backgrounds, um, fighting against being stereotyped, being profiled. Um, it just becomes increasingly important, I think, to highlight the positive um, success stories and just for us to create a better history and future for ourselves. So my guest today is Lord Mayor Talib Bensoura. I'll bring him on now. Welcome to the show, Talib. Thank you, Hadi. Thanks for Thank having you. me. It's so good to have you on. Um, I'm hoping that your voice today will just be able to encourage and uplift the African youth to stay together, um, uplift Africa, uplift African men also, more importantly, um, and also just be able to shift some of these perceptions, pardon me, that we're dealing with. So our topic of discussion will be why this new generation of Africans need to love Africa and also how we're gonna go about doing that and why we should be the ones to make a change and a difference. So let's get started. Sure. <laughs> how are you adjusting to the new way of working? In terms of being mayor? No, in terms of the coronavirus. Oh, um, yeah. How uh, is it affecting you guys there in Gambia? Well, it's affecting us same as I, I guess everywhere around the world. Um, it's a very strange time to be alive. Mm -hmm. uh, some are saying this hasn't happened for the last hundred years. Um, we, we had all our plans set for 2020. We were expecting it to be a great year for our municipality. But of course, since February, everything's been derailed. Uh, we've focused, uh, refocused our municipality to fight COVID uh, more than the development plans we've had. So it's an awkward time, but um, like everything else, you have to take challenges as they come and you have to be able to adapt. And that makes the difference between good leaders and not so good leaders. So it's uh, been very strange. Um, and we've experienced a huge fall in taxes. And as you know, councils depend on taxes. I can imagine, yeah. So we've had to also uh, uh, put in austerity measures and uh, really look at our financial controls to make sure we always have enough to provide the very basic of services. But I think our municipality has done, done a tremendous job uh, in taking a leap ahead of all other uh, government bodies, ensuring that people are well informed, uh, people are well protected, and uh, we, we do whatever we can to make sure there's no spread in our municipality and the Gambia at large. So mm -hmm. I think uh, we've handled it pretty well. Okay. And, and, and Mr. Mayor, you've been in office for two years now. Tell, um, tell us how much has your life changed since you've become a, become a mayor? It's changed uh, tremendously. Um, of course, thinking about politics and uh, planning to be in politics is different from actually living the life of a politician. Um, it's nonstop. Uh, you're dealing with thousands of people, uh, sometimes uh, hundreds of people in a week. Mm -hmm. And you have to really have a, a open door policy. Uh, grassroots must have access to your office. Uh, 
and you must be very visible. Uh, you must be uh, visible in all the areas of concern. Yes. Whenever there's a disaster or an incident, you have to be on the ground because it really assures people that um, uh, you're doing something about it, even if it doesn't necessarily make a difference. Just people seeing you on the ground gives them confidence. Okay. So you have to live for other people, which is uh, a very big shift from having a private life to a public life where you, you live every day thinking about how to serve people and how to uh, make sure that you fulfill your campaign promises. Mm -hmm. So it's a very big shift mentally and psychologically. Mm -hmm. So one, one must really think about getting into politics in that light to enjoy it. Uh, you must look at it as uh, being in fulfillment, uh, looking for legacy, and I think you'll enjoy it. But if you go into it with the wrong perceptions, it might be mm -hmm. more hidden than anything else. <laughs> Okay, so it sounds like you're very active in the community, but talk to us about your history in the community. Were you born there? So I'm born in uh, Fajara, uh, born and raised. Mm -hmm. um, I, I studied in Marina School. We had uh, Fajara and Marina last week, so this is starting exactly. to become a Fajara and Marina show. You're, you're starting to look biased. <laughs> right, so... so um, uh, pretty much, uh, this is where I was born. I went to school. I spent a bit of time in Bakau, where my grandma lives, uh, Bakau Sanchaba. And uh, I was never really into politics or uh, on a community level. Um, I left very early at the age of 17 for further studies in mm -hmm. Toronto, Canada. And that's when I became kind of a people's person uh, because I did odd jobs, including painting, uh, garbage collection with 1-800-GOT-JUNK and a lot of marketing jobs and I, I really got to know people and mm -hmm. I de dealt with multiple cultures and really I got interested in people and communities and since I came back I worked in insurance and various uh, um, uh, sorry I worked in insurance and I started a business in 2014 mm -hmm. but you know being from Gambia born and raised I love Gambia I, this is where I want to be yes. I could stay to get my citizenship and stuff, but I came home. I wanted to be in Gambia. I wanted to make it in Gambia. I wanted to work in Gambia. But as you know, uh, we had a, a, a regime that we viewed as very tyrannical, wasn't serving the people. And as a young person aspiring and wanting to live in a very vibrant society, uh, it was a disappointment. And so 2016 felt like an opportunity to bring a, a, a shift. Mm -hmm. a sh in the way we lived, a shift in the way we think as Gambians and where we believe we need to go. Mm -hmm. And as if you followed the Barrow campaign, you would realize that a majority of people in the campaign were young. Mm -hmm. uh, they were yearning for change. And so I was one of those people. And then when we had that change, or so we thought, mm -hmm. uh, I felt like I couldn't sit on the sidelines anymore. I had to be active. And mm -hmm. I had to be one of the people making a difference rather than just pointing fingers and blaming others. And mm -hmm. this is what brought me to where I am today. Mm -hmm. I think it's so interesting because like you said, all of this kind of started back in 2016. And before yeah. that, we see kind of great um, disenchantment when it comes to youth and politics. The youth are not really interested in, um, um, you know, going into um, politics. But also um, you're credited with um, bringing the youth again at the forefront of decision making um, in the country and, and with your um, Million Dallas Youth Initiative and, and several other um, youth initiatives that you have done, setting up young people, young entrepreneurs by um, investing in them and just giving them, providing them with that capital to start their own businesses. How would you say that things have changed under your watch? Well, I, I'm not sure if I can be 100% credited for bringing youths into politics. I think youths wanted to be in politics and I'm just a symbol of, of that uh, change. Mm -hmm. uh, so I came into to, to the game, like I said, I wanted to make a difference. I have mm -hmm. the energy, I feel I have the intellect, I feel I have uh, the passion. So I came in uh, wanting to make a change. And of course, everybody thought I was too young to run. Everybody thought I could possibly not make it. But like I said, uh, self-belief is the difference. Uh, I came in as the youngest candidate for 
the UDP primary election and I won the primary election. I was again the youngest candidate for the actual mayoral election and I won again. So mm -hmm. I think just that shows that the population would follow a youth if they believed you had what it takes uh, to bring a difference. Mm -hmm. And since we came into office, we've been trying to encourage more youths to take an active role in pop, uh, politics. We've been uh, trying to push youths to take an active role in the community and take leadership and bring solutions. Because Gambia, after all, is a youthful population. 65% of the population are between the ages of 18 and 35. So this is a youthful country. And therefore, youths have to take charge, we believe. Because at the end of the day, they're the majority. At the end of the day, the decisions that are made today would affect them tomorrow. They would be the adults of tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So this is the uh, change in mindset we want to bring. And I think we've been making significant strides. Uh, we've been trying to encourage youth uh, to take up on business. We launched a youth program through our youth council, Okemo Bojang, where we launched a $20 million initiative in partnership with Supersonics uh, Finance. Uh, this is just to encourage youth to get into small businesses and um, um, to, to try and make it in Gambia. Mm -hmm. And I myself, I'm a businessman before I'm a politician. Mm -hmm. I started a business in 2014 and it's thriving. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to also use that story to encourage youth that, look, you don't need to go to Europe. You don't need to uh, take a dangerous route uh, to mm -hmm. the West. You could stay in Gambia, make it. And I mean, after you make it, you could legitimately get a visa and go visit and come back. So mm -hmm. this is the story we've been trying to sell. I think it's slowly uh, being uh, bought by the youths. And I, I think eventually Gambia will have to get to that point where the youth believe they can make it in Gambia if Gambia is going to be a successful mm -hmm. nation. Um, I, I want you to expand on that um, a bit more, Mr. Mayor, because like you said, Gambia is a very young country. We have a population of just over 20 milli 2 million, 20 million, 2 million, um, and almost 60% or 65% are under 25s. Um, and generation after generation, we've just kind of seen the need to go outside for an education and for a better future and then perhaps come back again. But does this generation, our generation, the millennials, and Gen Z, do we still need to do that? We don't. And I think uh, this is the message we're trying to sell. And I think this ties into your introduction as well. Mm -hmm. If Blacks and people of African descent are to be respected worldwide, our, our countries of origin have to be prosperous. Our countries of origin have to be developed. Mm -hmm. Majority of our people have to be educated and know what they want in life and mm -hmm. must have pride in their heritage and where they come from. So yeah. it is very important for all youths uh, who have the stuff, meaning they have the resources, the opportunities, the education, to find the passion to really get into politics and try to transform their nation. This is the only way Blacks and people of African heritage could be respected uh, worldwide, mm -hmm. where we don't have to look at ourselves as victims anymore, but people in control of our own destiny. So this is uh, the sort of encouragement. This is a sort of uh, um, um, actions I'm taking on a day-to-day -day basis to show people that, yes, we can. I know it's cliche, <laughs> uh, yeah. Obama slogan, but it's true, we can. Uh, it's mind over matter. I, mean, I know sometimes you look around in Gambia, uh, infrastructure is dilapidated or lack thereof. Uh, you look at the amount of poverty, uh, illiteracy, um, and you, you, you become hopeless very easily. Uh, but if one looks at history, you realize developed countries today went through that phase. So mm -hmm. we're that generation that needs to sacrifice. Uh, this is a generation that needs to work more than they are compensated. This is a generation that needs to uh, um, uh, take a lot of time into productive activities and let go of uh, too much leisurely activities. So tomorrow, our kids uh, would be the generation that look at a developed Gambia and would be the kids that would be respected all around the world. So mm -hmm. this is the burden of this generation. Mm -hmm. You also mentioned being a businessman. Tell us about um, the business or businesses that you run. Um, who are you employing? Right, so I started my business in 2014. Uh, I was working in Banjul uh, as an insurance uh, director. Mm -hmm. And in the street I worked was not too far from the trading hub uh, in Gambia. Uh, 
Mm-hmm. Uh, I had a lot of insight also into trading businesses because I insured them. And of course, uh, like any young man trying to be rich, uh, I thought there was a lot of opportunity. I saw the numbers. I said, look, I think this is the way to go. So I approached it uh, in a very calculated manner uh, in the sense that I did not just go grab products and sell. I, I said, look, I want to create my own product. I want to carve out my own market. So I used some of my marketing education. I, I went into product development, market research, and I created my own brands. Uh, I created a diaper brand uh, called Baby Mariam. Uh, at the time, it was uh, mostly misconstrued as a Yaya Jame product <laughs> uh, because his daughter was named that. But uh, with some smart marketing, we were able to change that perception. Uh, we have other products uh, in, in tom- tomato paste. We have the Ami tea paste product. Uh, we have the Tahnasi brand. So I try to name products after my family members, or I, I would name them after well-known uh, uh, names locally. Mm-hmm. And so with some smart marketing, with some good people, we were mm-hmm. able to become market leaders in many of the sectors we were competing in. Uh, then we diversified into other smaller businesses. Mm-hmm. Uh, however, uh, today we employ about 40 people. Mm-hmm. Uh, most of them are young, below the age of 35. Mm-hmm. And I'm proud to say, actually, the top three managers running my company are all female, so which is which Bravo. is a, a good thing. Yeah. So, yeah. So that's the story of my business. It's been open now six years and it's been growing, and and we're very proud of the business. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. So you're also um, known for kind of venturing um, outside of Africa um, and turning to international allies for support. Um, we've seen you collaborate with the mayor of Bristol, for example, Turkey, um, for instance. Why is this important? Shouldn't we keep it Afrocentric? Well, um, what we realized when we came into office was uh, foreign relations was heavily dominated by the central government. There was little to no networking uh, by municipalities. And when you look around the world, you realize mayors uh, network internationally. And because you can learn from uh, best practices of what other cities are doing. And mostly all the challenges we face today, we're faced by other cities at one point or the other. And Mm -hmm. KMC becoming one of the most urban municipalities, uh, one of the most densely populated, or the most densely populated municipality in the Gambia. We have a lot to learn from other densely populated municipalities or urbanized centers. And so it's very important to network, uh, if not for best practices, Sometimes you, you, you get uh, a helping hand and, and also raises, raises the international profile of the city and the council. Mm-hmm. And if you could market your city, you're going to get more visitors, you're going to get more people interested, i.e. Uh, FDI, foreign direct investment, and, and other good things that you could bring for your city. So this is why we've put some focus on uh, trying to network as, as much as possible. Um, Also tell us um, about collaborating with local um, businesses and local stakeholders. What is the message here? Right. So what we discovered was we don't have a lack of capital in Gambia. Mm. Mm. We have a lack of smart capital, if if I may put it that way. The capital is around, but there's nobody around to really bring the stakeholders together and really direct that capital towards projects that could bring both a social benefit and a return for the private business person. So what we've realized is council lacked a lot in terms of resources, uh, both financial and human. Uh, We lacked a lot of uh, also, uh, uh, um, how would I say it? The community did not have much confidence in the council uh, and to want to partner with the council in any projects. So that's why we spent a lot of time trying to really uh, change the image of KMC from a politicized institution to a well-respected service-driven institution and to show that we were not there to to look for money or there to for any ulterior motives, but we are genuinely there to serve our people. So with that change in image, um, we had businesses who would knock on our door and ask if there's any opportunities so we started creating uh, products and uh, opportunities for public-private partnership. And to, like I said, search for that capital 
that's sort of just waiting and trying to turn it into smart capital uh, where we serve, use projects such as Dimbalit, collect the waste, which brings a social benefit, but also creates a return for the investor. And we kill two birds with one stone, where now residences in KMC are now having their waste collected after more than two decades with a very minimal charge. And at the same time, uh, the businessman gets a return on their investment where the trucks we got are paid off. So this is the thing we're encouraging. And really, since we've started having successful projects in public-private partnerships, every day a new business comes and provides an opportunity, brings about an idea. So there's that confidence now in the council as a brand where people know that we're a serious institution and the population knows that we are ready to serve. So, yeah. What about for COVID-19? Are you still, are you partnering with any businesses for this? So COVID-19 uh, is not a, a money-making venture by any means. Uh, COVID-19 is a life or death situation. Well, I mean, in terms of um, just bringing the community together, really, because you talk about um, collaborating with the business people and with the youth. Um, so I'm just thinking in terms of COVID, um, we've seen a lot of young people, um, for instance, um, may producing masks, let's say. So right. I'm collaborating yeah, with sense. the right. Right. Yeah. So with COVID-19, what we've done, because nobody budgeted for COVID-19, so mm. for there's uh, limited resources in that area. So we spent a lot of time trying to come up with ideas and we'd use council resources and sponsor some of it and then create a target and try to get uh, the private sector to fill the gap through their CSR budgets, their corporate social responsibility. Mm -hmm. And we've also tried to make our interventions as visible as possible so they know their money is going to the right place and have actually having an impact on the average uh, person within the municipality. So we've been able to bring a lot of private business on board to support our initiatives, to give donations. And we've also tried to make sure that all money raised is actually spent in Gambia for Gambians. Mm -hmm. So things that can be created here, uh, things that can add value, we make sure that they're created and done the right way. Meaning, for example, with the mask initiative, uh, we wanted to create 50,000 masks but this is something that could be done locally. So we engage local tailors within the municipality mm -hmm. and also provide some support in these very difficult times where we all know people are not going to parties anymore. There's no gentes or weddings. So <laughs> tailors are really uh, suffering. So this was another avenue where they could really keep their businesses afloat. Okay. So yeah, in that sense, we've been, we've been doing that. We've also been in, engaging our, our local weldermen and, and, and other craftsmen to create hand wash stations. Um, so including uh, GTTI, uh, we're discovering options to support students by giving them a project to create hand wash stations, which we're also working on at the moment. Brilliant. Okay, so moving on now to um, what this show is really trying to do, which is kind of redress um, the misperceptions of Africa. What do you say to the media's view of Africa as a corrupted continent, especially when it comes to our leaders? That's a very loaded question. <laughs> well, look, um, I don't think you could generalize mm. um, or, or just paint Africans as one. Through, um, we have issues of corruption uh, in Africa, and this is largely because of a uh, lack of structures largely because of uh, Africa being a new, na uh, being a, a continent with new nations. Gambia, for example, was uh, founded in 1965. Uh, uh, in, sorry, we had an independence in 1965 after hundreds of years of uh, both slavery and colo colo colonization. So um, these are new nations trying to find their feet, uh, trying to discover uh, their place in the world. And it's difficult. We've had a stretch of bad leadership, uh, a stretch of a uh, population who's lost uh, their heritage, their history. And it, it's gonna take strong leadership and uh, a widespread uh, leadership to really redefine our place in the world. But we have started seeing that we have more countries now with democracy, for example. We have more countries where leaders are more transparent and trying to uh, showcase their work. 
-hmm. and uh, we've seen that the people also are restless and, and want change. Uh, I don't think any African prefers to go and uh, try to cross the dangerous seas to make a living in the West. I think every person wants to make it where they are. Um, yeah. I think uh, now that the world is becoming populated, uh, the Western world as well have stretched resources. Africans are trying, starting to put pressure on their leaders to deliver. Mm -hmm. And I think the change will become organic mm -hmm. where now people know, uh, now especially with the pro proliferation of information, access to social media and knowing what's happening all over the world, people are not content anymore. They want the best lives and they're starting to demand the best lives. Demand and more, yeah. the change will, will come sooner than we think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you're saying that it's a work in progress? It's a work in progress, but we've seen that uh, the change is, is happening now at a faster rate than mm -hmm. one would imagine. And that's because of all this new technology that's bringing transparency in mm -hmm. the world. So I, I think Africa will change faster than people think. And it would be driven by young people. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I only ask this question because, you know, like I said, this is what we're perceived as, as, as a corrupted um, continent. And like I said, it's especially in terms of our leader. So you coming in, you're a fresh face, you're young. So you're able to um, just kind of change the way where we're viewed really. And you're able to kind of offer hope, I think as well, to a lot of young people who, like you said, are demanding more. Wow, that's a huge compliment. I'm only saying um, what I've heard over, you know, over the past few days since we've been advertising um, that you're coming on. We've received you know, a lot of positive feedback regarding yourself. Right. So, for example, our intention was not to create a ripple effect where people demand more from other leaders. Mm -hmm. We came in, like I said, as young people to, to change, right, rather than uh, be on the sidelines and blame others. We said, look, we want to change our country. We want to take matters into our own hands. So, I mean, we've seen how well-run well countries operate. And we said, look, we, we want to model our country after some of the good things. So transparency is huge for us at KMC. Accountability is extremely huge. And also reporting back to our people to let them, to give them progress reports about mm -hmm. what we said in our campaigns and how far we've gone with mm -hmm. our uh, 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 what do you call it, a manifesto. So because of that, I guess, people become happy that they've never seen something like this, at least for the KMC. Uh, they appreciate that, you know, we are not supermen. We can't change things overnight, but at least we are reporting back to them. At least we are telling them how much money is in our accounts, how much money we are spending, where we are spending it on. And then, you know, it's a small country, so they start demanding from other leaders. And I think it's unintentional, but we've seen other councils, for example, react to KMC's uh, positive initiatives. Sometimes you even seen the central government follow our lead on some matters. So I think for the most part is a, a largely positive thing. We also learn from what other councils are doing and sometimes uh, what other politicians do because we serve the same people and we want to give them the best of service. So like I said, as more of this kind of leadership style comes, as more young people get into politics, the change will be organic. Mm -hmm. And before you know it, uh, it's all institutions will be accountable, transparent, and well run. Yeah. So before we move on to taking um, the questions, yeah. what would be the legacy you'd like to leave behind? So um, our slogan was together for a better KMC. Uh, we came in and said, look, it's a mess. We want to make sure by the time we leave, it has improved uh, uh, drastically. And we want, it to, we want to do it together. We want to bring the community on board. We want to make sure that this is a partnership with the community. So we want to leave a KMC that is uh, serving the people, one, um, mm -hmm. creating basic services. Uh, we also want to leave a council that is very accountable, transparent, and also that is owned and run by the community where community has a big say and um, they look at the council as their own. So mm -hmm. this is uh, the kind of legacy we want to leave at uh, KMC. Okay, so we'll move on to our first question from Ibrahim. 
um, who says, I'd like to ask um, Mayor Bensouda, when the locals see him in the street or in the community, what do they usually say to you? Is it more complaints or praise? I think it's a mixture. It's a mixture of both. Mm -hmm. uh, praises are mostly reserved behind my back. Um, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's very rare for somebody to see me and just want to praise me first thing. They usually have an issue they want me to, to think about or draw my attention to. Mm -hmm. Most of the praises I heard through third parties like yourself, which mm -hmm. I think is the way to go. Um, I, I like when my uh, fire is put to my feet uh, to, to do more and, and to not be satisfied and to not just look at what the good things people are saying, but to also know that there's a lot of work to be done. I mean, it motivates me, right? Uh, mm -hmm. when, when I know, okay, look, I've done a lot, but it's far from where we need to be. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a mixture of both. Uh, one time I went to the streets and we were cleaning the road and a kid was like, Mayor, I think you should put a street bin somewhere here. You see this banana I'm holding? I'm just going to throw it on the ground. <laughs> and I was just pointed at him and say, hey, don't throw that banana, but that's a good idea. So yeah. this is actually what inspired me to come up with the 500 street bin, mm -hmm. in, right? So on a daily basis, you get complaints about markets, roads, mm -hmm. infrastructure, services, mm -hmm. and people do like to rate our uh, waste collection service. So whenever I see people, they tell me, okay, this is a good initiative, but sometimes they're late or sometimes, uh, your guys are not the most uh, customer service oriented, and it's a mixture, really. Mm -hmm. But but you, would you say that the issues that the pressing issues for the, the the people in the community are being dealt with? Absolutely. As soon as we get them, we do our best to to react as fast as possible. Mm -hmm. uh, complaint we always say in the office in KMC is we would rather people come direct to us rather than go to social media or to the news. Mm -hmm. uh, what we understand is part of the democratic process. People yeah. uh, think about the news and social media first, but we would like to encourage them that this is a council for the people. Uh, we've actually put in a lot of effort in ensuring that we come closer to the community. Mm -hmm. We have uh, done an unprecedented thing, which is we opened a ward office in all our 19 wards, mm -hmm. just so people have a complaint desk in their neighborhood. Mm -hmm. People feel like they're close to the council. Mm -hmm. So my office is always open as well. Uh, there's only so many people I can see in a day, yes. but we do our best to, to get complaints. Also, we have a Twitter account, we have an Instagram account, mm -hmm. we have a uh, Facebook, where we would appreciate if people could also send messages and complain. Mm -hmm. to our public relations department. Mm -hmm. So we do our best to, to, to solve as many complaints are, uh, that are possible within our means, or at the minimum to explain to people why they can be solved at this point. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Um, second question now from Usman Kohli. It says, if someone came to you with a proposal to build a new piece of public infrastructure in your city, um, how would you evaluate whether that project was worth implementing? Right, so people come to my office with ideas like that all the time. Uh, so we have structures within our municipality. We have um, uh, contracts committees, we have development committees, mm -hmm. waste committees, finance committees. So depending on what the project is about, we usually funnel it to that committee. Uh, the committee is a mixture of experts within that field and counselors, and they really mull over it and, and look at the pros and cons and do the analysis. And if it's worthwhile or there's a potential, then they would elevate it to the political level, which is my office, uh, okay. to look at closer. Sometimes we lack the expertise in that particular committee. So the, I set up a task force to find um, the expertise who would actually sit over it. So as we speak, we have about four active task forces and about 12 committees. Mm -hmm. And it's the same procedure for, say, somebody in the diaspora who wanted to it's the same procedure. It's the same procedure. Uh, okay. It's usually very difficult to um, uh, coordinate with people in the diaspora. Mm -hmm. We do sometimes, but given the distance and given that they don't have a presence on the ground, mm -hmm. um, because KMC uh, uh, due diligence is very high on our, on our priority list. Mm -hmm. Whoever we deal with, we, you, we have lawyers. Uh, we do our due diligence to ensure that uh, there's legitimacy uh, behind the, the business. And it's usually more difficult when you don't have presence on the ground. Mm 
-hmm. but, but we still entertain uh, any proposal from anywhere. And are you looking at changing that issue of presence on the ground? Are we looking at changing it? Yeah. In terms of? Are you looking at having somebody here on the ground, like a representative that people could perhaps get in touch with, or, you know, if there's any, like you said, complaints, issues, any proposals even? Right. So, like I said, we have social media, we have a website, we have uh, emails. Uh, mm -hmm. we, we do get these proposals, and I would direct anybody who wants to send proposals from the diaspora to these uh, 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 mediums. Mm -hmm. uh, I was just saying, in terms of due diligence, it's more difficult mm -hmm. uh, to verify somebody if you're not on the ground, but we still yeah. do. Okay. Uh, teams that look at it. Um, but, but if they do have people on the ground, we prefer if they walked into our office. Okay, okay. Thanks for clearing that up. And a final question from Sana Dabo, and I think this is lovely to end on. It says, How, what's a typical Sunday like in the Bensura household? <laughs> <laughs> So it can be boring sometimes, mm -hmm. uh, given that I do some of my uh, business work on Sundays. But I mean, it's a, a, a day of changing diapers and uh, feeding <laughs> the kids. You spend a lot of family time. Uh, sometimes uh, going to the beach or going to see the grandmas. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think it's just an average. On, on, on really, really uh, free Sundays, I do have barbecues <laughs> like I have one today just close friends I get on the grill and just make some burgers or something like that mm -hmm. uh, but that's usually uh, Sunday at my house okay all right well thank you so very much for speaking to us Mr. Mayor it's been an absolute pleasure and thank also you. That's okay. Thank you also to everyone um, that stayed with us and that's joined in on the conversation, sending in their questions. Um, I hope you are well and you're safe wherever you are. Um, also, I'd like to say follow um, my page on Facebook and Instagram at Stories from the Continent to keep in touch with the latest news and, and find out who next week's guest will be. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>